Turkey, and frankly, my view of uh, Erdogan is going to be a little different from what you just heard. To begin with, I'm going to talk about three groups of fundamentalism in Turkey. One which is aligned basically with the Muslim Brotherhood in the Arab world. One which is more Salafi. I would say it's more involved, let's say, with the Saudis. The third is Gulen, the uh, Gulen movement, Fethullah Gulen, which is uh, interested, shall we say, in a Turkic Islam. Uh, in general, the view is that the Turks uh, have the real Islam and these other primitive peoples should learn from us Turks. And I'll give you some examples of this. And then in the end, I want to talk about an odd thing. I'm going to call it at the Turkish Islam. Because that may be the only hope for the Islamic world in the future, at least for the Sunni world, not for the Shia. Now, when Erdogan first came to power, after the Iraq war in 2003, I ended up in Istanbul. There was a little conference on how do we repair Turkish-American relations. And frankly, the story that I have, because I was involved with this, on why the Turkish parliament did not allow the American forces to come to, uh, to use Turkey, and probably would have saved the American lives, and the war would have been over more quickly had we been able to. Um, it's slightly different, it wouldn't surprise me, shall we say, in the slightest, if it was engineered that way by the ruler of Turkey at the time, the Prime Minister Erdogan. Not 100% sure, but it sure seemed that way in Ankara at the time. Anyway, 2003, after the war, there's a little conference, as I mentioned, on how to improve American-Turkish relations. And shall we say, fundamentalism in Turkey and government was sort of new. That's called it soft fundamentalism. The fundamentalism of Prime Minister Erdogan and President Kuhn. It wasn't really clear what was happening. Now, Prime Minister Erdogan had a, uh, an associate at the time, Junet Zabsul. And he, at this little conference, we had invited us over to his house. And the present economics minister of Turkey was there. And um, he basically was trying to say, there's no Wahhabism, there's no fundamentalism, basically, in Turkey. And Erdogan is, is not this. It was interesting that all of a sudden, that in Turkey, which wasn't so wealthy at the time, you had Sunni mosques being built absolutely everywhere, beautiful ones, especially in Alevi towns and villages. Alevis don't need mosques. They have Cemevi there. These are gathering places. This was nothing more than Sunni imperialism. It appeared to be funded by the Wahhabis. He said, Zapsu, there was no Wahhabi money in Turkey. But then we got into another discussion and he said, um, I asked him, I said, tell me, is uh, Turkey an important country in the Muslim world? He said, of course. I said, isn't it interesting that Wahhabi money is everywhere in the Muslim world, except Turkey? It's absurd. Frankly, it was all over. Now let's divide into three groups uh, that I mentioned earlier in, in the beginning. The Muslim Brotherhood, I think you can all hear what uh, Prime Minister Erdogan and uh, Davutoglu, the foreign minister, they're extremely upset that the military in Egypt has uh, uh, overthrown the Muslim Brotherhood. What's the Brotherhood? It's also supported by the Qataris. Now, Qataris are actually Wahhabis, but more importantly, they hate the Saudis. They created Al Jazeera. And th this is viciously anti Saudi by and large. If you look at the Arabic version, the English version is probably one of the best TV stations around for news. And it's, let's call it soft porn. Because we in the West look at. Uh, and Jazeera in, Arabic, in English and think, oh, it's nothing more than a translation in Arabic. Completely different world stations. But anyway, Karadawi, the chief fundamentalist for Al Jazeera, 
is basically the Brotherhood. And Qatar has been supporting the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, and Qatar is very close with Erdogan, and this is one of the fundamentalist forces in Turkey. What is the Brotherhood all about? It wants to use modern methods to implement the Islamic view of the world, which is there is two parts of the world, the world which is Muslim and the world which eventually will be Muslim, because of course the whole world will be Muslim and everybody in this room is going to convert in some day. That's how they understand it. Maybe we may not think that, but they do. Another one in Turkey itself is filled with Qatari money. Qatari business men are all over the place. It's one of the reasons why Turkey has become so wealthy. Because Qatar is about I don't know, there's a quarter million people and a lot of foreigners and a huge amount of money. They have nothing to do with the money. So they propagate their version of Islam. Now there's another one. There's the Salafi version. If I am correct, good, the president is a little closer to this. If I am correct, what do I mean? Some years ago, the Saudi king came when Gur was, I, I'm not sure whether he was president or prime minister at the time, because in the very beginning when Erdogan couldn't be prime minister, Gur was like the, the stand in. But he was the leader. Anyway, the Saudis come, and they're Wahhabis, Salafis, and I'll explain the difference in the brother because they hate each other with a passion. The Saudis come, and right away, literally, they arrive in their hotel, which of course has been remade with all sorts of gold floors and things like that. And who comes to see him right away? And it's right on Turkish TV. Gül, Abdullah Gül, comes to them. Now in the Middle East, who comes to whom matters? And the message really was, oh, you Saudis are doing it right, and we're going to do it your way, and things like that. And maybe not how in Turkey ended up. But the Salafis have a very different view, and that is, as Muhammad said, I think it's a hadith, a tradition attributed to um, the Muslim prophet. And that is, that only my generation and the next two will really know what Islam is about. The rest will be innovations and things. So we need to go back to the 7th century version of Islam, which of course is the correct one. That is the Salafi view. That in essence is what the Wahhabis are doing. And that, it seems, is uh, what some of Gud's friends are. If you notice that Gud and, and Erdogan sometimes say very different si things about the political situations at hand. Let me go on to the third group, Gulen. Remarkably interesting group of people. On the day of the flotilla, Mr. Gulen, who is living about 200 kilometers north of Philadelphia in the United States, publishes an article in the Wall Street Journal pro-Israeli. Oh, if you know nothing about him, you therefore think he's pro-Israeli. What he is is anti-Ardawan. He was opposed to the flotilla, and he comes up with all sorts of very interesting logic. Well, Gunan has schools all over the Turkic world. And what is interesting how they're doing, they don't publicize this, but you know a whole series of people who've been educated in Gunan schools in Central Asia, and they're trying very hard to influence the Chinese, Turkic, Uyghur population as well. And they have schools also in the United States. And in the Gulen schools, let me just give you an idea what happens. They try to get people into their view of the world. And what is their view of the world? Turkic Islam is the right Islam. All these other primitive peoples, like the Arabs, they're just, they don't know what they're doing. We know, follow us. We think, well, oh, what is this? There's a, a problem here, a rift here? Well, to quote a friend of mine who grew up in Erdogan's, um, uh, excuse me, in um, Gulen schools, and this was in a Central Asian Republic, and simply to protect them, I'm not going to say which republic, he said, we would have these sort of seances, where you have seven people sitting around a table, and there would be an eighth place with a cup of tea. We all had tea. Why an eighth place, which was empty? just in case the Prophet Muhammad would choose to join us. What did they do with these seances and what did they teach? Viciously anti-American stuff, viciously anti-Israel, viciously anti-Christian, viciously anti-Semitic uh, things. I think I've covered the basis pretty much there. And of course, anti-Shia. 
These guys are very active in Turkey too. So we have three forces. Whatever the case is, what do I have, like five minutes or something? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Whatever the case is with these three forces, and uh, Yanko, if you're going to be a guinea pig, I'm rather sorry. <laughs> You'll see. If Islam is to survive, Sunni Islam is to survive in the world today, it is going to need some form of reformation. Christianity did that in the 1500s, 1600s, whatever. We Jews did it a lot earlier because we were a minority and had to live in a majority society, so we managed to find ways to reinterpret our texts. Because the West is unsure of itself today, and we constantly say things, uh, somebody will do something. For example, there was this Fort Hood um, problem in the United States where one of these, uh, I think it was a psychiatrist, a, a, a Palestinian starts to kill all sorts of people yelling, Allahu, Allahu Akbar, and with all sorts of Islamic things, and of course this has nothing to do with Islam. Now, what happens is, when the Muslims see, I'm, poor Yaakov is my victim here, when he's almost nine years old, so it's unfair of me to do this. But we, what happens is, they keep hitting us, and we say, oh, um, uh, 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 you know, they didn't react, he's weak. But in reality, Yaakov's getting mad because I keep hitting him. And sooner or later, something is going to happen, we don't know when. And God help the Sunni world. I am not advocating this. I am saying this is what is happening. In the United States, for example, today, we started off many years ago, the problem was within Islam. Most Americans don't think the problem is within Islam. Why aren't people speaking out now and saying, um, Muslims have, why aren't Muslims saying Islam is a religion of peace? All this is going on in Turkey and they're seeing us in the West as weak. Or if I may say, so your president here, when Erdogan basically told him where to go with the, da the Davos question, oh, oh we, 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 we need to have peace and we ought to, you got to call things for what they are. As the greatest professor of Middle Eastern history alive, Bernard Lewis, would say, he spits in my eye and I say, it's raining. That's what's happening. The fundamentalists in Turkey are in a battle. The only possible hope, as far as I'm concerned, for Turkey in the long run, I'm going to call it Ataturkist Islam. What is Ataturkist Islam? It almost sounds like a contradiction in terms, but it isn't. Because Ataturk and his, uh, his uh, supporters understood that morals and values have to come from somewhere. And they tried to relegate religion to the realm of the private having dealt with a lot of senior Turkish military officers over the years, some of them, this is the Ramadan, and they would be fasting today. But that was the realm between them and God. Now I know that's not an Islamic view of the world because there is no separation between religion and state in Islam. But that's what Atatürk are trying to do. That you use Islam as a source of morals and values, but the state and your world is secular. I want to tell you that there are a lot of intellectuals in Turkey, and I want there's, there's someone who has a very senior post that 30 years ago as a young diplomat told me the following. He was angry at Ataturk, and he's an Ataturkist. Why? He said, because you in the West, Christianity is the bottom line, and we are Muslims, so we're outside. Why was he angry at Ataturk? Because he didn't make us Christians. Now that sounds, because that would go, you therefore cross the divide, and then we wouldn't have to worry about Greece, and we wouldn't have to worry about this, because we would all be equal. And he pulled out a story, and he said, you know, when uh, Fatih Mehmet, the guy who conquered Istanbul in 1453, there is a story, I, mean, I don't know whether it's true, that he had to decide, should he be stay a Muslim, or possibly become head of the Greek Orthodox Church. And he thought about it a bit. I don't know whether it's true. But he decided in the end to remain a Muslim. He said, oh, two minutes, that much? Anyway, 
I'm not saying that that's the answer. But everything that has gone on lately shows that Turkey is not a Western country. It's part of the Middle East. The way Erdogan is reacting, and I have it for anybody who's interested in the Gatestone Institute, it's like that I have an article on this today. And in essence, Erdogan can admit no wrong. He's never made a mistake. Middle Easterners, as you know, if your personal honor, if you say I'm wrong, you made a mistake, the Palestinians have never made mistakes. The Ikhwan, the, the brother in, in Egypt, never made mistakes. You can't, the only way to get to a, to, to, to solve, to, to get to something better, is say, you know, I made mistakes and go wrong. This is not, this is part of, I think, Islamic culture. It's certainly part of, a deep part of, Tur of Turkish culture. Because, in the end, there is no way out of Islam. Once you become a Muslim, you're a Muslim forever. There is only one narrative. It is the Muslim narrative. It is the right narrative. And the whole world will be Muslim. And Abdullah knows it. He's actually offered some leaders at times. You know, would you solve your problem? Become a Muslim. Khomeini did the same thing. If you remember, he offered Gorbachev the opportunity. Just become a Muslim. Everything will be fine. Turkey's in a mess. God willing, it will get unmessed. And to me, I think the only way you can really survive is to go back to some form of Atatürkism, and it may not happen. I have, I'm, not, I'm a historian, not a prophet. And, uh, and that would be, Islam is in the realm of the private for, for morals, for values, and it needs that reformation, because in Islam there are sources that can be reinterpreted just like in Judaism and Christianity to deal with the modern world. And the only way I think is going to happen is that I'm hitting Yaakov and hitting Yaakov, Yaakov gets mad, and boom, he may be a little older than I, but in the end, if I, if I get a man, he's going to be more dangerous than I am. We'll see what happens in Turkey in the future, God willing, uh, things will work well, and I hope this made some sense.